Hello and welcome to our Ogmore by Sea Church's Reading the Bible Together. My name is Dom, I'm the pastor of the church, and it's really good that you can join me as we continue to read some of First Kings. I hope you're doing well. I pray this is a blessing to you. We've reached chapter four. We've got a lot to read. So we ought to pray, and then we're going to dive in. So please would you pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have set your king in Zion. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he's not like all the other rulers of this passing age, but he is truly the king. He's the king of kings. He is supreme above all authority, and yet he is the one who is so committed to serve us out of gracious love. And in his name we come, trusting in his cross and resurrection. And we pray that you would speak to each one of us now. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So here we are. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. So King Solomon ruled over all Israel. And these were his chief officials, Azariah, son of Zadok, the priest, Elihoreth, and Ahijah, sons of Shisha, secretaries, Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, recorder, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, commander-in-chief, Zadok and Abiathar, priests, Abiathar, priests, hmm, interesting, Azariah, son of Nathan, in charge of the district governors, Zabud, son of Nathan, a priest and advisor to the king, Ahasha, palace administrator, Adoniram, son of Abda, in charge of forced labour. Solomon had 12 district governors over all Israel who supplied provisions for the king and the royal household. Each one had to provide supplies for one month in the year. These are their names. Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim, Ben-Zidika in Machaz, Shal-Bim, Beth-Shemesh and Elon-Beth-Hanan, Ben-Hesed in Araboth, Sukko and all the land of Hepha were his, Ben Abinadab in Naphoth, Dor. He was married to Taphath, daughter of Solomon. Diana, son of Ahlud, in Tayanak and Megiddo, and in all of Beth Shan, next to Zerathan, below Jezreel, from Beth Shan to Ab Abel, Mehela, across to Jokmiam. You know you can speed all this up when I'm butchering all the names. Just on the little cog, you can go on the speed of which you listen to it back. It will probably save you a bit of pain. Uh, ben Geber in Ramoth Gilead. The settlements of Jair, son of Manasseh in Gilead, were his, as well as the region of Argob in Bashan and its 60 large walled cities with bronze gate bars. Ahinadab, son of Ido in Mahanaim, Ahimeaz in Nephtali, he had married Bazamath, son of Solomon, sorry, daughter of Solomon, <laughs> Diana, son of Hushai, in Asher and in Aloth, Jehoshaphat, son of Parua, in Issachar, Shimei, son of Elah, in Benjamin, Geba, son of Uri, in Gilead, the country of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and the country of Og, king of Bashan, he was the only governor over the district. The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Think of the promise made to Abraham there. You're getting a little glimpse of it being fulfilled. I should also say that here is a son of David setting in good orderliness. Administration is a kingly business. And the king, Solomon, son of David, pictures Jesus in how he orders the church. So they were there were loads of them, more numerous as the sand on the seashore, which is bonkers when you think of it. I mean, it's just an idiom that we say without really thinking about what it means. But here in Ogmore by Sea, we know the beach quite well, and you couldn't in your whole lifetime count all the grains of sand on just Ogmore Beach, let alone all the beaches of the world. So it's a phenomenal statement. 
They ate, they drank, and they were happy. And Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. These countries brought tribute and were Solomon's subjects all his life. Again, that's a little glimpse of the messianic reign of Jesus, where all the nations will come to him, bringing him tribute. Uh, but, yeah, it's not... Anyway, let's not get sidetracked. Verse 22. Solomon's daily provisions were 30 cores of the finest flour and 60 cores of meal. Let's find out how much a core is. That is probably about 11 tons or about 10 metric tons. Wow. Is that why we say core? Core blimey. It's because it's a lot. Uh, 10 head of stool fed cattle, 20 of pasture fed cattle and 100 sheep and goats as well as deer, gazelles, roebucks and choice fowl. For he ruled over all the kingdoms west of the Euphrates River from Tifsa to Gaza and had peace on all sides. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel from Dan to Beersheba lived in safety, everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. Again, that is picking up the imagery of the promises found in Deuteronomy, the blessing of the Lord on his people for faithfulness for faith uh but that's daily provisions wow solomon had four thousand stools for chariot horses and twelve thousand horses now that's also in the law that's in exodus 17 the instructions for the king of israel but it says not to amass a massive army not to get loads of horses and chariots because the danger is You'll end up trusting in them rather than finding your safety in the Lord. He's the one who'd led them out, formed them into a people. He's the one who is to watch over them. He was their strength and their shield. Again, think of the promises to Abraham. Verse 27. The district governors, each in his month, supplied provisions for King Solomon and all who came to the king's table. They saw to it that nothing was lacking. They also brought to the proper place their quotas of barley and straw for the chariot horses and the other horses. And this is what the Lord warned through Samuel the prophet before Saul was appointed king over God's people, is that having a king like the other nations, it would be burdensome. And even Solomon, for his greatness, despite his greatness, he was still a burden to his people. And you'll see that with Rehoboam later on in the story, Solomon's son. But the beautiful thing is, it's a photo negative of King Jesus, who says his burden is easy. No, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. You see, it's from his rich riches that he establishes kingdom. And it's through his power that his kingdom is sustained. It's not us. It's him. Photo negative. Verse 29. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan, the Ezraite, wiser than Heman, Kalkol, and Dada, the sons of Mahol. And his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. <laughs> it's quite a playlist, isn't it? He spoke about plant life, from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. It's pretty impressive stuff, but we're told, is it in Matthew chapter 12, someone greater than Solomon walked the earth. Let's look it up. Oh, but the internet's being slow. Is it going to? Yeah.
uh, here we go. They asked for a sign. Verse 39, this is Jesus. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus, the wisdom of God, greater than Solomon. Let's keep reading. Chapter 5, verse 1. When Hiram, king of Tyre, heard that Solomon had been anointed king to succeed his father David, he sent his envoys to Solomon because he had always been on friendly terms with David. Solomon sent back this message to Hiram. You know that because of the wars waged against my father David from all sides... He could not build a temple for the name of the Lord his God until the Lord put his enemies under his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side, and there is no adversary or disaster. I intend therefore to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord told my father David when he said, Your son, whom I will put on the throne in your place, will build the temple for my name. So give orders that cedars of Lebanon be cut for me, my men will will work with yours, and I will pay you for your men whatever wages you set. You know that we have no one skilled in felling timber, as you know that we have no one so skilled in felling timber as the Sidonians. Uh, so the Lord had put it in David's heart to build a house for the name of the Lord, a temple, because he felt guilty that he lived in this palace made of stone and wood and gold. All the while, the tabernacle was still a tent, the tent of meeting. And so the Lord put it in his heart to build the temple. But the Lord said, no. He said, David, you think you're going to build me a house? I'm going to build a house for you. And really, it's a promise that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, would be born into his line, his family. His son would build the house of the Lord. And it just so happens that the next king is the son of David, and he does build a physical house, but that is only a little glimpse of the true fulfillment of this promise of the son of David who builds the house. It's Jesus, the word of God, who is God, who comes and who dwells among us and who takes on our flesh, who tabernacles with us, and he speaks of the destruction of the temple, speaking of his death, because in him the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. He is the meeting place for humanity and the living God. He is the place of sacrifice. He is the place of praise. Jesus, his body, is the true temple. He's the son of David in that ultimate sense, in that he builds the temple of the living God. But it goes on from there, of course, because in Jesus we are called living stones and we are built into this spiritual house and through the Holy Spirit the fullness of God dwells in us and we are called the body of Christ. And so the body of Christ, the temple of the living God, is all one and the same great reality of who we are as God's people in Jesus, Messiah, son of David. But Solomon pictures that in this little way, this building of the majestic uh, temple. I mean, the disciples marveled at how big the stones were of the temple in their day, and that wasn't even near the glorious majesty of the temple that Solomon built. So there's this correspondence between Hiram and Solomon. Solomon has sent his reply. Verse 7, when Hiram heard Solomon's message, he was greatly pleased and said, praise be to the Lord today, for he has given David a wise son to rule over this great nation. So Hiram sent word to Solomon, I've received the message you sent me, 
and will do all you want in providing the cedar and juniper logs. My men will haul them down from Lebanon to the Mediterranean Sea, and I will float them as rafts by sea to the place you specify. There I will separate them, and you can take them away. And you are to grant my wish by providing food for my royal household. In this way, Hiram kept Solomon supplied with all the cedar and juniper logs he wanted, and Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household, in addition to 20,000 baths of pressed olive oil. Solomon continued to do this for Hiram year after year. The Lord gave Solomon wisdom, just as he had promised him. There were peaceful relations between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. King Solomon conscripted labourers from all Israel, 30,000 men. He sent them off to Lebanon in shifts of 10,000 a month, so that they spent one month in Lebanon and two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of the forced labour. We just read that, haven't we? Solomon had 70,000 car carriers and 80,000 stone cutters in the hills, as well as 3,300 foremen who, had, who supervised the project and directed the workers. At the king's command, they removed from the quarry large blocks of high-grade stone to provide a foundation of dressed stone for the temple. The craftsmen of Solomon and Hiram and workers from Bibelos cut out and prepared the timber and stone for the building of the temple. Chapter 6. In the 480th year after the Israelites came out of Egypt. 480th year. There's a footnote there. I want to click on it after 80th. Hebrew, Septuagint, 440th. Interesting. I quite like the Septuagint. I don't know why there's the discrepancy, but it's still a long time. Whether it's 440 or 480, that is a long time. Um, so they come out of Egypt. And during that time, of course, there was the 40 years wandering the wilderness. There was uh, conquering the promised land of Cana and then there was the time of the judges and then you have Saul and David so all that takes place in that time the temple that King Solomon built for the Lord was 60 cubits long 20 wide and 30 high uh, and the cubit I think is that kind of length it's a human measure 60 long this will probably tell us what it is in today's money. That is about 90 feet long, 30 wide and 45 feet high. Or about 27 metres long, 9 metres wide and 14 metres high. Grand stuff. But not nearly as grand as Ezekiel's temple. Verse 3, the portico at the front of the main hall of the temple extended the width of the temple, that is 20 cubits, and projected 10 cubits from the front of the temple. He made narrow windows high up in the temple walls, against the walls of the main hall, and in a sanctuary he built a structure around the building in which there were side rooms. The lowest floor was 5 cubits wide, the middle floor 6 cubits, and the third floor 7. He made offset ledges around the outside of the temple so that nothing would be inserted into the temple walls. In building the temple, only blocks dressed at the quarry were used, and no hammer, chisel, or any other iron tool was heard at the temple site while it was being built. Which is remarkable in itself, and you can see that there is this real attention to detail, and not wanting to veer off the pattern that was set, or pattern that was given to Moses as he was on Mount Sinai all those years ago, that blueprint for the tent of meeting. Because there is this understanding that this main section of the temple was its own unit, and nothing could drive into it, it was there. That was where the meaning was. So there were side rooms, there was additions, but careful not to overstep the mark. 
literally. Verse 8. The entrance to the lowest floor was on the south side of the temple. A stairway led up to the middle level and from there to the third. So he built the temple and completed it, roofing it with beams and cedar planks. And he built the side rooms all along the temple. The height of each was five cubits, and they were attached to the temple by beams of cedar. The word of the Lord came to Solomon. Now we know who the person, the word of the Lord is, don't we? It's Jesus. No one has ever seen God, but God who's at the Father's side has made him known. And Jesus says to Solomon, As for this temple you are building, if you follow my decrees, observe my laws and keep all my commands and obey them, I will fulfill through you the promise I gave to David your father, and I will and I will live among the Israelites and will not abandon my people Israel. That's the great promise that we would live with the living God. So Solomon built the temple and completed it. He lined its interior walls with cedar boards, panelling them from the floor of the temple to the ceiling, and covered the floor of the temple with planks of juniper. He partitioned off 20 cubits at the rear of the temple with cedar boards from floor to ce ceiling to form within the temple an inner sanctuary, the most holy place. The main hall in front of this room was 40 cubits long. The inside of the temple was cedar carved with gourds and open flowers. Everything was cedar. No stone was to be seen. Mm. So this has got everything to do with this big idea which spans the whole Bible of this garden paradise. See it in Eden. We see it in new creation. We see it in the temple. God's dwelling place with humanity. And it is reminiscent, isn't it, of a garden. These plants and all the design and seeing the wood. Verse 19, he prepared the inner sanctuary within the temple to set the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord there. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 wide and 20 high. It was this perfect cube. He overlaid the inside with pure gold, and he also overlaid the altar of cedar. Solomon covered the inside of the temple with pure gold, and he extended gold chains across the front of the inner sanctuary, which was overlaid with gold. So he overlaid the whole interior with gold. He also overlaid with gold the altar that belonged to the inner sanctuary. For the inner sanctuary, he made a pair of cherubim out of olive wood each 10 cubits high. That's pretty massive. And these cherubim, don't think of little cherubs. These are crazy creatures, spiritual warriors. They stand or fly <laughs> in the presence of the living God. Anyway, verse 24. One wing of the first cherub was five cubits long and the other wing five cubits. 10 cubits from wing to wing tip to wing tip. The second cherub also measured 10 cubits for the two cherubs were identical in size and shape. The height of each cherub was 10 cubits. He placed the cherubim. So cherubim is the plural of cherub, by the way. He placed the cherubim inside the innermost room of the temple with their wings spread out. The wing of one cherub touched one wall, while the wing of the other touched the other wall, and their wings touched each other in the middle of the room. He overlaid the cherubim with gold. And that is like an exaggerated version of the Ark of the Covenant, which was there, because it had these two cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant, with their wings outstretched. And it symbolized the throne of the living God. Verse 29. On the walls all around the temple, in both the inner and outer rooms, he carved cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. He also covered the floors of both the inner and outer room of the temple with gold. It must have been an amazing place. Verse 31. For the entrance to the inner sanctuary, he had made doors out of olive wood, that were one-fifth of the width of the sanctuary. 
and on the two olive wood doors he carved cherubim, palm trees and open flowers, and overlaid the cherubim and palm trees with hammered gold. In the same way, for the entrance to the main hall, he made door frames out of olive wood that were one-fourth of the width of the hall. He also made two doors out of juniper wood, each having two leaves that turned in sockets. He carved cherubim, palm trees and open flowers on them and overlaid them with gold hammered evenly over the carvings. Excuse me. And he built the inner courtyard of three courses of dressed stone and one course of trimmed cedar beams. The foundation of the temple of the Lord was laid in the fourth year in the month of Ziv, in the eleventh year in the month of Bull, the eighth month the temple was finished in all its details according to its specifications. He had spent seven years building it. It took Solomon 13 years, however, to complete the construction of his palace. Now, he had inherited a palace, palace from David, so he is doing some renovation and extension work, which is fair enough that he wants to concentrate on building the temple of the Lord, for that is his God-ordained purpose, really, isn't it? To picture Jesus in that way. Verse 2, he built the palace of the forest of Lebanon, a hundred cubits long, 50 wide and 30 high, with four rows of cedar columns supporting trimmed cedar beams. It was roofed with cedar above the beams that rested on the columns, 45 beams, 15 to a row. Its windows were placed high in sets of three, facing each other. All the doorways and rectangular frames, they, they were in the front part in sets of three facing each other. He made a colonnade 50 cubits long and 30 wide in front of it, a portico, and in front of that were pillars and an overhanging roof. And it's exciting that things happen in Solomon's colonnade in years to come. He built the throne hall, the hall of justice, where he was to judge, and he covered it with cedar from floor to ceiling. And the palace in which he was to live, set farther back, was similar in design. Solomon also made a palace like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had married. All these structures, from the outside to the great courtyard and from foundation to eaves were made of blocks of high-grade stone cut to size and smoothed on their inner and outer faces. The foundations were laid with large stones of good quality, some measuring 10 cubits and some 8. Above were high-grade stones cut to size and cedar beams. The, the great courtyard was surrounded by a wall of three courses of dressed stone and one course of trimmed cedar beams as was the inner courtyard of the temple of the Lord with its portico. So he wants his palace to be some kind of reflection of the Lord's palace. That's what it's like. Verse 13, King Solomon sent to Tyre and brought Hiram, who was mother, whose mother was a widow from the tribe of Naphtali and whose father was from Tyre and a skilled craftsman in bronze. Hiram was filled with wisdom, with understanding and with knowledge to do all kinds of bronze work. He came to King Solomon and did all the work assigned to him. Now that reminds us of Ohaliab and Bezalel, who were the skilled craftsmen equipped by the Holy Spirit to build the tabernacle. And it is the same spirit here who is at work in Huram. He cast two bronze pillars, each 18 cubits high and 12 cubits in circumference. He also made two capitals of cast bronze to set on the tops of the pillars. Each capital was five cubits high. A network of interwoven chains adorned the capitals on top of the pillars, seven for each capital. He made pomegranates in two rows encircling each network to decorate the capitals on top of the pillars. He did the same for each capital. The capitals on top of the pillars in the portico were in the shape of lilies, four cubits high. On the capitals of both pillars above the bowl-shaped part next to the network were the 200 pomegranates in rows all around. He erected the pillars at the portico of the temple. The pillar to the south he named Jachin and the one to the north Boaz. 
And I love that they're given names and we know those names. Um, where can I click on, where does it say? Jakin. Probably means he establishes and Boaz probably means in him is strength. But they're actual names. People are actually called these things. And we know of Boaz. He's like the great, 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 great grandfather of King David. And who married Ruth. And we hear about him in the book of Ruth. But it points to this New Testament reality. New Testament reality. I don't really like that because it was a reality there and then in the Old Testament as well. Even whilst there were the pictures and the shadows of the perfection of Jesus. But what I'm trying to say is that, yeah, we are living stones. When we, we sometimes say, oh, that person is a pillar of the community. It's like that. It's that there are individuals who are pillars in the church. And the apostles, they're like the foundation and, and all this. But yeah, you get it. So I love it that the pillars were named Jacob and Boaz. Verse 22, the capitals on top were in the shape of lilies, and so the work on the pillars were, was completed. He made the sea of cast metal. And this sea was this massive bowl, and we'll see that there were these oxen underneath which served to hold it up. But this was also part of the furniture of the tabernacle. And the sea was the place to draw the water for uh, washing and cleansing, you could call baptisms, you know, uh, and for other parts of the worship and ceremony. There is huge, this one. Um, so he made the sea of cast metal, circular in shape, measuring 10 cubits from rim to rim and five cubits high. It took a line of 30 cubits to measure around it. Below the rim, gourds encircled it, 10 to a cubit. The gourds were cast in two rows in one piece with the sea. And, I mean, I'm no good at DIY, so I'm not the person to talk to about how this was even possible. But it just seemed like to make a metal bowl, a perfect metal bowl, to be used in the service of the Lord, that big it seems crazy, but then to also have this ornate decoration on this massive bowl, which is cast with it, it just seems uh, a little bit ridiculously lavish to me, or it just seems impossible to me. Uh, and this sea was placed at the entrance of the tent because just as baptism is the entrance way into the church it was the entrance way into the worship uh yeah so its position was significant verse 25 the sea stood on 12 bulls three facing north three facing west three facing south and three facing east the sea rested on top of them and their hindquarters were toward the centre. It was a handbreadth in thickness, and its rim was like the rim of a cup, like a lily blossom. So it kind of spills over in a beautiful flowing way. It held 2,000 baths. So now we're talking about the magnitude of this thing. That is about 12,000 gallons or about 44,000 litres. The Septuagint doesn't have this sentence. Verse 27. He also made ten movable stands of bronze. Each was four cubits long, four wide and three high. This is how the stands were made. They had side panels attached to uprights. On the panels between the uprights were lions, bulls and cherubim. And on the uprights as well. Above and below the lions and bulls were wreaths of hammered work. Each stand had four bronze wheels, 
with bronze axles and each had a basin resting on four supports cast with wreaths on each side. On the inside of the stand there was an opening that had a circular frame one cubit deep. This opening was round and with its base work it measured a cubit and a half. Around its opening there was engraving. Of course everything gets engraving doesn't it? The panels of the stands were square not round. The four wheels were under the panels and square not round reminds me of like the throne of God and it was linked to the cherubim that moved just in straight lines. Um, maybe there's that kind of idea going on that this is some kind of reflection of the ministry of the angels. The diameter of each wheel was a cubit and a half. The wheels were made like chariot wheels, the axles, rims, spokes and hubs were all of cast metal. Each stand had four handles, one on each corner, projecting from the stand. At the top of the stand there was a circular band half a cubit deep. The supports and panels were attached to the top of the stand. He engraved cherubim, lion and palm trees on the surfaces of the supports and on the panels in every available space with wreaths all around. This is the way he made the ten stands. They were all cast in the same moulds and were identical in size and shape. He then made ten bronze basins, each holding forty baths and measuring four cubits across. So you had this C and then you had the basins to make it a bit more manageable and in various places that you would need the water. Um, so one basin to go on each of the ten stands. He placed five of the stands on the south side of the temple and five on the north. He placed the sea on the south side at the southeast corner of the temple. He also made the pots and shovels and sprinkling bowls. And that also makes us think of various teachings in the New, in the New Testament where we are like not only to like the building blocks of the temple, but also the utensils used in the temple. Because... We are, we are to be used in the service of the living God. So Huram finished all the work he had undertaken for King Solomon in the temple of the Lord. The two pillars, the two bowl-shaped capitals on top of the pillars, the two sets of network decorating the two bowl-shaped capitals on top of the pillars, the 400 pomegranates for the, set, for the two sets of network, two rows of pomegranates for each network decorating the bowl-shaped capitals on top of the pillars, the ten stands with their ten basins, the sea and the twelve bowls under it, the pots, shovels and sprinkling bowls. Now that is quite an output of work, isn't it? Amazing. And surely it can only be done through the wisdom and skill provided by the Holy Spirit who is there overseeing the work and empowering the word of God as all things were created. All these objects that Hiram made for King Solomon for the temple of the Lord were of burnished bronze. Burnished bronze has this idea of fire. The king had them cast in clay moulds in the plain of the Jordan between Sukkoth and Zerathan. Solomon left all these things unweighed because there were so many. The weight of the bronze was not determined. Literally innumerable, measureless incalculable and if someone is good at minecraft then i challenge you to recreate this in minecraft so we can see it and explore it i'd love that verse 48 solomon also made all the furnishings that were in the lord's temple the golden altar the golden table on which the bread of the pre on which was the bread of the presence the lampstands of pure gold, five on the right and five on the left in front of the inner sanctuary. The gold floral work and lamps and tongs. The pure gold basins, wick trimmers, sprinkling bowls, dishes and censers. And the gold sockets for the doors of the innermost room, the most holy place. And also for the doors of the main hall of the temple. I have probably said this many times. And I have learnt it from Paul Blackham, and I'm grateful to him for it. Uh, but 
we see in the furniture representations of the three persons of the living God. So in the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, you have the Ark of the Covenant. That's like the throne room. That represents the Father, the Most High God. But on the other side of the curtain or the doors, in this instance, it seems like it, in Solomon's temple, you had the bread of the presence in the holy place. And that pictures the bread of life, Jesus. And you also have this golden lampstand represents the spirit. And when it was the construction of the tabernacle, those pieces of furniture were made before the tabernacle. But the tabernacle, one of the lessons of it is how it pictures how the whole universe fits together. And if there's something that's made before what represents the universe being made, then we've got to think, who was there before the creation of all things? Well, there was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's deep stuff. But often people, Christians, give up thinking about the Trinity because they think, well, it's just a mystery. But there is, there are lessons for us to learn in Scripture. And it is pictured for us. Uh, right, let's keep going. Verse 51. When all the work King Solomon had done for the temple of the Lord was finished, he brought in the things his father David had dedicated, the silver and gold and the furnishings, and he placed them in the treasuries of the Lord's temple. Wonderful. Well, we're going to have to leave it there for now, but I really do pray that this is a blessing to you. And the big question is whether you are part of the temple of the living God today. It's all well and good reading about Solomon's temple, how grand it is, but there is a more beautiful temple. There is a meeting place between humanity and the living God. And that is you and I as we trust in Jesus. So I'll leave you with that and I'll see you again soon. Thanks for joining me. God bless.